Uh, hello, welcome to the state of generative AI views from the frontier. We have so much to get through, so I'm just going to do a quick intro for all of our speakers and then jump in. Uh, this is Andrew Ng, founder and CEO of DeepLearning.ai. We have Pilar Menchon, Senior Director of Research and Strategy at Google AI. We have Sarah Hooker, Director at Cohere for, A uh, Co Cohere for AI, and Peter Hallinan, Leader of Responsible AI at AWS AI. Thank you guys for coming. Um, Andrew, I just want to start with you, and I'm just going to jump right in. Um, We've had such an intense year of AI development. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about anything that's surprised you about some of the recent advancements technologically. And has anything surprised you about the way we are talking about governing and living with these systems? Yep. AI is a general purpose technology, like electricity. And I think we're in the process of identifying a lot of use cases. Um, if I were to ask you what is electricity good for, it's almost hard to answer that question because it's useful for so many things and AI is like that too. So a lot of work remains with new generative AI, but also other things like supervised learning, labeling things that started work well years ago to figure out the applications. But I would say, here's my biggest surprise. I was not expecting that in 2023, I'd be spending this much time to try to convince governments not to outlaw open source software or to pass laws that effectively make open source software impractical for many organizations to keep contributing to. Because that's a fundamental building block, it's very democratizing. I think earlier this morning, um, uh, Jeremy Jurgen talked about we don't want to leave nations behind. Guess what? If some of the lobbyist attempts to shut out open source succeed, there'll be a lot of losers and a tiny number of winners. Almost everyone in this room, almost all nations will be a loser if those lobbying efforts succeed, and that deeply concerns me. I'm curious if any of the other panelists, if you agree with Andrew's perspective on open source being outlawed, or if there are other models to think about. Yeah, I just don't think it's binary. I think it's so, it's a really interesting. I lead a research team, and we build uh, both these models as well as the next generation models, but as Andrew is saying, we come from uh, a community of AI researchers where open source is just very core to how we've developed our field and to progress within the field. But frankly, um, I also wrestle with the fact that we're not in a conference center anymore and our work is used by millions of people around the world. I actually think, so our lab open sources and publishes, we're actually open sourcing a large multilingual model next year. So I say this as someone who's actively wrestling with these questions because I actually think maybe the mistake is we treat it as open source or not open source. And perhaps more interested as a technical conversation is how do we have responsible release? What does it look like to still give researchers and independent organizations and all these organizations that are necessary for progress access to all of this while also making sure that we're developing the technology for model traceability and for uh, data traceability? Because right now, I think the main concern driving these questions of nuance around open source is the reality that these models are being used in ways that are powerful for good, but also can be used in ways that are unintended by the researchers who build them. Can you just describe what you mean when you say traceability? Right now, and maybe I'll give an example, because when I mentioned we're actively grappling with it, we're releasing a multilingual model because most of the models right now are English first. They serve English. Andrew is completely correct by saying, who is left behind? Well, we're releasing Aya because it serves many more languages. But when we release this model, it will be weights. And that means that when we drop the release these weights, anyone can just copy it. It's a file. And you can just, essentially, we lose our ability to track where it's being used. I think there's interesting urgency to technical questions around this. Can we have model signatures? In the sense, can we trace where models are used? But it is an extremely challenging technical uh, problem. And so I also don't want to. Um, I, I don't want to minimize the, the amount of work that would be needed to have uh, serious model traceability. Yeah. Pilar, how does Google think about this? What is, is the idea that open source represents sort of 
I don't know, a uh, challenge to safety? I mean, how are you thinking through that particular question yourself? Well, we release a lot of open software, right? And we release a lot of models and we release a lot of tools. So we are active contributors to the community and we completely support it. But, um, you know, in terms of completely open sourcing some of the models, then you have to take into consideration the benefits and the downsides, the trade-offs. And in this case, like, like Sarah said, it's not a binary decision. It's more about when you release, what you release, with what level of traceability, control, transparency, and responsibility. So I think that we have to find the right kind of balance, and that's what we are trying to do with Google as well, with an open architecture, open infrastructure that enables you to, to use not only Google's models, but also any model, any open source model or any model that, that you have access to, so that people can choose the level of risk that they want to undertake, how they want to work, how much testing is done, and the level of transparency uh, of each of those models. So I think that the answer is a little more complex but we're dealing with not only the complexity of all the technologies that we're still researching about, but a complexity of releasing them in a safe way and allowing for research and also making sure that other countries don't fall behind, other communities don't fall behind, and so we democratize it. But we have to be careful. There's a lot of interesting ideas there, but I just wanted a key in on that word safe. I mean, AI safety, we've been talking a lot about that as a concept. Uh, but it's not particularly well defined. I think most most of us don't quite know specifically what that means. And then I'm curious, yeah, what is what is safe in these scenarios? What is the appropriate level of safety? So I feel like you know, AI does have risks, um, and I think that if you look at different applications of AI, for example, media, social media. Um, if you build a medical device, if you build a self-driving car, all of those things could cause very significant harm and the thing deserve to be regulated. Um, and I think the problem with a lot of the current regulatory proposals is rather than regulating at the application layer, they tend to regulate at the technology layer. So for example, the White House executive order from a few weeks ago was starting to propose reporting requirements and maybe other burdens in the future for basically if you build a big AI system, then you have, you know, starting to burden some uh, regulatory requirements. And I think some proposals uh, in Europe also have a similar flavor. And the problem with regulating the technology layer is, we know that if you want more of something, you know, don't add friction to it. To me, the heart of the question is, do we think the world is better off with more intelligence, human intelligence or artificial intelligence? Yes, intelligence can be used for nefarious purposes, but I think that as the world became more educated, more intelligent, we became better off, even though, you know, there were some nefarious uses of intelligence. So the problem with the current regulatory proposals is it adds friction to the creation of intelligence. And also, whereas in contrast, I think we need good AI laws to say if you serve a billion users, which by the way means you have the capacity for, uh, for burdensome compliance, then let's get transparency and regulation and safety and auditing. But if the same laws place a similar burden on a small startup or a big company or a very small research and big company, then this is about um, uh, letting companies climb up and then pull up the ladder behind themselves so that no one else can follow them. And that's unfortunately where a lot of the proposals, uh, where a lot of the proposals are headed. Interesting. If I may jump in with something as well, um, I think that that is super important and obviously regulating the applications and the domains in the context of even the, what, the, what was said in the previous panel is super important, not the technology itself, because it could be used for anything. So uh, that's 100%. But I think that it's very important that we think in terms of the users that are able to use the technology but don't understand it deep enough to know what the collateral impact of what they're doing is. So it's not only, safety doesn't only mean using it in a safe way or creating it for people who intend to do bad things with it, but also for unintended collateral effects of people who do not understand what they're doing well enough to, to know, to know better. Peter, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I'd just like to add, maybe couple together the open source and the, the safety issues, if you will. Um, so just speaking for AWS, right, we're a big proponent of uh, open source software. We support the PyTorch framework. We're supporting Llama. 
Um, and part of that is simply to offer options. So we don't have the perspective that there's going to be one model to rule them all. There are, in fact, uh, going to be a variety of base models, a variety of specialized models. But you know, there's a lot to learn about these models still. Um, and when you have open source models available, people can do research. Uh, they can explore things. They can learn. And that improves safety uh, across the board. So I think these are, these are highly coupled issues. And yes, you know, one has to strike a balance. There are issues with more knowledge can be used for good or for bad. Um, but it's better to have a smaller set of uh, sort of known unknowns and a smaller set of unknown unknowns than a larger set, I think. And I think the open source uh, work contributes to reducing both of those. It's I'm curious, Sarah, if you can talk a little bit about the broader discussion we're having globally around AI safety and the risks, especially existential risks versus near-term risks. There seems to be, that also is a binary conversation. And I'm curious if you could talk about whether that framing is helpful, whether how that's shaped the, the way we all think about AI. Yeah, maybe you asked because perhaps I'm a bit grumpy about this. So, <laughs> I mean, I think firstly the notion of safety, right? We talk about safety. We often talk about a lot of desirable concepts like this. We talked about interpretability for ages as if it's a finish line. And one day we're like, it's safe. It's interpretable rather than a spectrum. I think there's a more nuanced divide, which in some ways has, has created a lot of value-driven divides that have kind of polarized a research community as, as people who build this technology about where do we place the emphasis in terms of risk? Like we, these models, when you, it's very rare as a researcher that you build something that is used overnight, that research and direct world impact collide and it only happens a few times in, in history. So I think what researchers are grappling with where is this technology is being used right now, but also the pace of acceleration is felt by, I think, everyone in a nuanced way. However, how that's translated and is in this divide about whether we focus on longer term risk, which may be harder to measure progress against because you know, when you think about something long term that's existential, essentially what you're saying is something devastating that um, we may not be able to articulate now, but is a future threat. Or do you focus on the reality of these models being deployed every day? You mentioned, you know, the, how do users know what they don't know? Or how do you calibrate hallucinations or misinformation, which is something which I think we're going to talk about um, in much more urgent tones. Uh, but we're not talking about yet enough. If that, I, I think in many ways this is, for me, one of the risks that is most present and we have to articulate. And that's why I think we can't treat open source as a binary. We have to acknowledge open source is really critical, but it amplifies risk. What should we do? And I think that's a much more interesting conversation to have because then we can funnel the resources we need to really equip ourselves for what's coming next year, which is that elections are going to be held all over the world. And we don't have traceability tools, and we don't have good ways to implement. So how do we navigate this divide? I think what I always try and um, uh, state is the tools for both existential risks and present risks require better auditing tools at scale. We have large models with millions of uh, data points that are trained on, but also being used in very different ways. Whether you care about uh, risk, which is perhaps more long term, like bio, um, uh, bio risk or cyber threats, or if you care about things that are very fundamental and present today, like hallucinations, we still need the ability to audit. And that is very difficult because take red teaming. If I asked Andrew, what does red teaming mean to you? And then I, I asked Pilar, what does red teaming mean to you? You may give me totally different answers. Like, how long should it go for? Should it be your friends in a Slack uh, thread? Should it be a, a dedicated group that does it in an ongoing way for a productionized system? We have to have these crucial, precise conversations, even about the reality of how we tackle any risk, and anchor it to the tools we have possible. And so that's why. 
I think it's okay if some people in this room feel very strongly about bio-risk. I'm not going to try and dissuade you, um, although I can at lunch, that maybe we have to really care about what's happening right now. But I do think what's important is we have a more precise conversation about the limitations of our current tools, even for present-day risks, let alone the longer-term risks. Yeah. I mean, you just said something, you said a lot of really interesting things, but the one I wanted to get back to is the idea that open source amplifies risk. And Andrew, I was just curious, you know, if, if that's the case, what is the problem with additional regulation and barriers if open source technologies are you know, if they amplify risk, if they're more vulnerable to problems. Actually, I think what Peter said was the opposite. Not that open source amplifies risk, but the transparency actually helps to reduce the risk. Is yes. that, did, I, did I interpret Peter's correctly, did Peter? Something. Yes, it's, it's both, right? I mean, you get people doing diverse things. I mean, you're not going to have uh, guarantees of watermarked output from open source, uh, you know, text to image synthesizers for sure. The ecosystem is more complicated. But on the other hand, you gain a lot of understanding. Um, I think you know the focus on safety, uh, there's so much temptation to focus just on a foundation model. Um, we're basically in a process of experimenting and co-engineering you know, sort of new human workflows with new technologies. It's very hard to put each of these AIs into the single box, right? Some of them uh, are quite simple. Some of them are quite complicated. Uh, I think one has to sort of approach this on a use case by use case basis, where use cases are defined extremely narrowly, so narrowly that they'll give anybody in marketing conniptions, right? Uh, right? But you know, face recognition, for example, is not a use case. There's many different applications of, of face recognition technology, but you have to think very carefully, am I trying to do you know, uh, virtual proctoring? Am I trying to look up uh, a found child in a database of missing children? Am I trying to you know, index uh, um, an actor uh, within a, a, a video data set. All of these are different use cases. They get tuned differently. Um, Gen AI has dangled in front of us this, this beautiful model that can do so many different things. And yet, as we deploy it, we need to go back to the basics of narrow use cases. What in this particular situation makes sense? You know, your, your question earlier about what is safe enough, right? You give me a model that does anything, I can't answer your question. But if you give me an application domain, a specific narrow use case, I can answer the question. And more importantly, right, we're deploying, I mean, lots of people, lots of enterprises, lots of individuals are trying these technologies out. You know, you have to kind of scope the, the challenge the deployment challenge, the building challenge, to who's actually doing it. If you make it a broad use case, people get stuck. But if it's a narrow use case, then you can have a development team, um, which is not you know, uh, world-class philosophers and ethicists. You can have pe reasonable people make reasonable decisions about how to do this safely. And I think, so I think you're sort of narrowing in um, thinking carefully about risk, which, by the way, is a social decision-making process. It's not a turn the crank and this is the risk kind of thing. And then, and then really understanding, you know, that there is a shared responsibility model. Um, I know that it's been, you know, understood in security. For example, AWS has a shared security model where AWS takes care of part and the customer takes care of part. But in ML, it's endemic with the technology. ML is really about statistics. We're rolling out statistics, OK? And once you put privacy in play, um, you know, the deployer has visibility on their data. The builder does not. The deployer must understand how to test. Testing is not easy. Okay, that requires that you introspect, that you think about what's acceptable in your particular use case. Um, it's a time-consuming you know, process. It takes a lot of social discourse and discussion, just as risk assessment does. 
Um, but that's key to this. Anyway, I'll pause there. I get very excited think, about this stuff. I think, I think Peter is right. Um, so uh, the thing about AI, and Peter mentioned the term foundation models. Um, so large companies are training, you know, these large and increasing startups are training the base AI model from, say, reading a trillion words on the internet. And that's a core technology component. Um, many of you will have used ChatGPT or Bard or other tools like that as a consumer tool. There's one segment that I think is underappreciated, which is these tools are a fantastic building block for others to write software on top of them, not just to use as a consumer tool. So maybe one quick example. Um, you know, in previous lives, I've built applications for, say, email routing. Customer sends an email, what department do I route this to? And with traditional AI techniques, it might have taken me and very good AI teams like six months to build something like that. Thanks to this generation of tools, there are now hundreds of thousands of people they can build in maybe a week what used to take me six months. And so this dramatic lowering of the barrier to entry means that there is starting to be and there will be a lot more AI applications out there in the world. And this comes back to the point of AI being a general purpose technology. It's not just chat, GPT, and BOD. It's being used in corporations for email routing. It's being used to help with legal documents, with nascent approaches to help, to help with healthcare. I've been working with the former CEO of Tinder, Renata Nyborg, on AI applied to you know, relationship mentoring. Uh, but there are going to be far more applications than any one of us can probably imagine at this point. And the problem with the regulations and open source is if you um, slow down the work on the technology, on the foundations model, you're saying, let's slow down AI for all of these wonderful applications, most of which we have not even imagined yet, as opposed to if you were to say, oh, if you want to use AI to build a medical device, well, I know what are the risks of that. You have to prove your medical device is safe before we you know, put in a human body. Or if you want to use AI for, um, uh, for, for underwriting, well, we know we don't want underwriting to be biased or unfair, so I know what the risks are. Let's really regulate that. And I think this, that, that's why I really agree with what Peter is saying, that um, regulating the technology foundation model there is just saying we want less AI. That would damage most of the world. But if we regulate the application layer, then we can re be realistic about the risk without kind of slowing the world down. What is relationship mentoring? This oh, so my team at AI Fund, uh, we decided to apply AI to um, relationship coaching. And you might wonder, like Andrew, he, I, I'm an AI guy. What do I know about romantic relationships? Uh, <laughs> and, and in fact, if, 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 if you don't believe me, you can actually ask my wife. My wife will confirm that I know nothing about romance. <laughs> But, but I wanted to get together with uh, Renata Nibel, former CEO of Tinder, um, and then my team wound up building with, collaborating with her to build a product uh, that she launched, uh, announced a few weeks ago called Mino, that is a romantic relationship mentor to help individuals think through um, relationships. I think U.S. Surgeon General has declared um, loneliness an epidemic in the United States. It's actually worse for you to be that lonely than to, say, smoke 15 cigarettes a day, I think. Um, and so you know, Renata, with, with a little bit of help from us, is trying to use AI to help with, I think, a really, really important uh, global problem. Hmm. I may add something, uh, because I think what you said was super interesting, and I am uh, in agreement with you probably 99%. <laughs> but Let's it's, talk uh, about the 1%. Yeah, <laughs> we like the arguments. <laughs> that other 1%, um, something that uh, I think we all know is that the legal system, the regulation, and and the uh, the collateral impact of everything that we are doing always comes far behind what we're doing, and we all can acknowledge that AI is not only accelerating accelerating in itself, but accelerating everything. So it's hard to find a domain, a science, an industry, anywhere where AI is not having some kind of an impact. And if you start thinking about reducing you know, and analyzing each of those use cases and the millions of other use cases that we haven't even thought about that we could ever do or use for, there is no regulation, there is no law, there is no precedence. And you know, we, people that are here, <laughs> we struggle to keep up to, to be up to date with the latest of the latest. And if you include there the morality or the ethical or the values of what if we apply this to that, that try to think about a judge, try to think about whether something is legal or ethical or whether there is collateral damage. 
if we run so fast that the rest of society cannot come with us safely, then we're going to create a whole generation of casualties of the collateral and intended impact of you know, this renaissance and revolution that is on the one hand wonderful, but on the other hand unprecedented in size and, and speed. So we do need to take that into consideration. I'm as excited as you were about the renaissance of all these wonderful things that we can do with AI. But at the same time, I have, we have to think about who else is there that is not an AI that has to follow and has to suffer the consequences of what won't necessarily go all the way right. I, I empathize with what you're saying. You make a good point. And I just worry that the difficulty of doing it right is being used as an excuse to do it wrong. Mm. Interesting. I'm curious how you guys, how anyone on the panel that wants to address this, I mean, what's to come? You know, we have all talked about agents, right? AI agents, the idea that you might have a system that interacts with other systems that do things that are potentially helpful for you. For me, it would be reading all the emails from my kids' preschool. That would be very helpful to have an AI agent that does that. But uh, what, are the, what are your thoughts on, on the feasibility of those kinds of systems? Like how, how quickly can they come? Or what are the technological challenges that might stand in their way? I'll just say these systems are here now. Uh, that's, uh, uh, if, if there is something you know, big coming in, in you know, this year, uh, well, it's already been announced, uh, right? Uh, you know, the ability to sort of hook LLMs up to stuff and start doing things is just very attractive. Um, now, <laughs> I hope, uh, take this as a clear directive, do not do things like try and steer a power grid uh, or anything that's sort of a risky connection with these. But these will start on the consumer side. Right, just as uh, OpenAI has released recently. I mean, there's going to be lots of opportunities to hook these models up to things and have little apps. And you know, notice that in a chat that, uh, oh, you're asking for the value of this thing, and then it spins up a little script to you know, write it and do the calculation on the fly. All of that kind of stuff is, is here. Um, now, how good it is, OK, it will get better over time. Um, I, I raise it because it complicates this business of shared responsibility um, and testing. Uh, you know, the notion of privacy is critical throughout. Um, what happens when someone has signed up to use um, sort of an orchestrated uh, agent system and they want their data uh, to be theirs, as they should? Um, and yet the system is spinning up um, like little programs to execute various calculations that are needed. And it's derived the structure of the program uh, from the context of the chat. Like how is that actually tested and verified, right? It begins to, like we know how to do that. But you know, what we're beginning to do is integrate a lot of pieces together. Um, and it just takes care and thought and you know, sort of step by step. I mean, I don't think you can turn it off, um, but uh, it's here. Um, and I think it's partially exciting and partially test. Please test. <laughs> I don't know. I would say it's here, but it's pretty clunky. <laughs> I mean, maybe yes. I'll describe the technical problem. I mean, you're trying to use l l large models with the infrastructure of the internet. <laughs> and the infrastructure of the internet was built in very fractured ways. The whole notion of API design is because people choose different ways of doing it in different places. So what you'll notice now is that What's compelling about this idea of agents is in some ways we leverage external knowledge all the time, right? We, our, our ability to connect with other humans has been amplified by having the internet or having a phone, which is probably very close to you. Wherever you're sitting now, you probably have your phone somewhere close. That's, that's something which is an auxiliary tool of information. The reality, though, is that you have to make all this work with the internet, and it's going to be fractured. So you'll notice people are starting by very particular use cases. I think in the short term, 
this is going to be the reality because it will be hard to pivot and create more general agents. I agree completely with Peter, the idea of safety. What does it mean to be in the loop? You know, how do you, if an agent conducts a, you know, a transaction for you, how, what's the accountability if it goes wrong? Like uh, the notion of, um, and that's a very base example, but there's much more um, perhaps problematic ones. So we have to think about what does um, intervention points look like. Uh, I will say that's a medium-term problem, but we need to start working on it now. This wide idea of what's exciting, I think uh, for me, uh, what's really interesting is things like multilingual, so making these models more robust in different parts of the world, multimodal, so how the original vision of AI was let's uh, impart to machines skills reserved for humans, but the way it was implemented throughout computer science history has been these disparate fields. You would have audio and computer vision and language. And what's exciting about this moment is that we have the compute power perhaps to crudely do multimodal. <laughs> right now our main solution seems to be throwing a lot of compute at it, but it's the first step in having a more nuanced approach. I would also say, for me, adaptive computation is one of the most interesting ideas that is really important because if you think about it, we're addicted to this formula of bigger is better. Why do we do that? Because we essentially throw a huge model at every single data point the same amount of times, and that's not how humans apply, uh, like approach our environment. We typically apply more compute capacity to things which are more difficult. We squint if we don't understand something, but we largely ignore things that are easy. This idea of how can we have adaptive compute is, for me, one of the most fundamental questions of how can we avoid this ladder to the moon, where we won't, we're trying to just uh, really use this crude tool of parameter counts to try and approach more and more intelligent systems. So um, what's adaptive compute? It actually, I think, is a few things. Some are actually already in production. You can think of a mixture of experts as adaptive compute, but it's not the, a mixture of experts right now, frankly, is kind of a efficiency solution. It's just to reduce the total number of flops, but it's not truly modular or specialized. If you squint hard, you'll say it's specialized, you'll say every expert is doing a different thing, but the reality for people who've worked on it is that we don't have good ways of in, enforcing specialization. But the ideal thing is you have different models which are specialized in different things. But it's also things like early exit. Like, why do we have to show every example to the model the same amount of times? So it's also things like, what is the critical subset of data points to train on? Um, a lot of our work as a lab has been showing maybe you don't have to train on all of the internet. Maybe, in fact, it really matters what you pay attention to. But for me, this is one of the most interesting because it moves us away from this paradigm um, of uniformity, where you're treating uh, all data points the same, but you're also applying all weights to all data points. And it's a very interesting direction. Yeah, I don't know. Andrew, it looks mm -hmm. like you want to say something. Go no, for no. it. No, it, it makes sense. There's a paradigm, emerging paradigm in AI called data-centric AI, where the yeah. idea is instead of trying to get as much data as possible, Instead of just focusing on big data, focus on good data um, so that you can focus your attention on what's actually most useful to expand your computation on. Maybe, can I just add, I'll, I'll just add some, some other things I'm, I'm excited about. So Sarah mentioned multimodal. Um, just, to, just to make some predictions about upcoming trends, um, I think we've all seen the text processing revolution. I think the vision image processing revolution is maybe a couple years behind the text processing revolution, and images and text do come together with multimodal. But what I'm seeing is that uh, computers are starting to really perceive or see the world much better than ever before. And rather than image generation, I'm seeing the breakthrough in image analysis. So this will have consequences, for example, with um, you know, maybe self-driving cars, where they're able to perceive the environment much more accurately uh, than, than, than before. So if you're at a you know, business with a lot of images, I think there could be consequences for this. Um, and then I think, uh, what else? I think agents, just to just add, we chat a lot about agents already, but this is one of the Wild West areas of AI research right now, frankly. So I, I think of the term agents is not well-defined. People use it in different ways, but this concept that um, right now you can prompt or you can tell a large language model like ChatGPT or Bot what to do, it does it for you, that's, you know, that, that, that's there now. But this idea that we can say, dear AI, um, help me do market research for the top competitors of this firm, and it will decide by itself 
the steps to do that. First, do a web search for the competitors, then visit each of the competitors' websites, then generate summaries and go and do all those steps. So this idea you can have a computer figure out a multi-step plan and then carry the multi-step plan. That's kind of at the heart of the agent's concept. And right now, what I'm seeing is I've seen fantastic demos uh, that look amazing, but you know, most of us, we just can't get them to work, right, for, for, for most practical commercial things just yet, despite the amazing demos. But it is coming. A lot of us are working on it and paying attention to it. And I think when that becomes more widespread, it, it, it would be an exciting breakthrough. How um, long to, until we have agents that can book flights for us? <laughs> Go for it, Andrew. I, don't know. I think for verticalized <laughs> applications, it might be quite easy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in fact, you know, e even now, um, versions of ChatGPT can decide to browse the web, decide when to visit another web page, whether to scroll down the web page. And I think that, um, oh, and, and even now, if you, one of the biggest application sectors of um, large language models has been customer operations or customer service representatives. And so if you go to a website and chat to a customer service representative, you know, these bots are integrated to take action, such as it has to decide at some point is it going to issue a refund or not? Or what call a database query to answer your question about, you know, um, uh, when is your order that you, should, when, when was your order shipped and when, when was it going to arrive? So these AI models, they can start to take some actions by querying databases or sometimes even something as, you know, maybe risky as, as issuing a refund, right? You don't want to get that wrong. Uh, that, that is already starting to get there. Interesting. Um, I just want to remind the audience that we are taking questions, which I'll take in a couple of minutes. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just limit myself to one. Uh, I'm curious how you see the field continuing to develop over the next five to ten years. You know, what are, I mean, we've talked about agents and that being both here and also, you know, some years away. But what are the other applications, other things that people are, are working on and trying to trying to push us towards. I have a suggestion for many of you from different businesses, which is whenever there's a new wave of technology, the media and societal interest tends to be at the technology of the tooling layer because it's fun to talk about, it's cutting edge. Um, but it turns out that the only way for the tooling layer, for the technology layer to be successful, like the clouds and the OpenAI API servers and so on, the only way for that to be successful is if the applications built on top of them are even more successful so that they can generate enough revenue to pay for all these tools that we read about in the media. Um, for whatever reason, you know, in earlier ways of technology innovation as well, a lot of the attention is on the technology layer rather than the application layer. But kind of for this whole ecosystem to be successful, almost by definition, the applications have to generate even more revenue. And I think that's where um, a lot of the richest opportunities lie, to look at your business, figure out what are the specific use cases in your business, and then to go do that. And, and, and what, what actually some of my friends, Eric Brynolfsson and others have done, and, and my teams do this too, is work with businesses to try to analyze if you have 10,000 or 100,000 employees, what are all these people actually doing? And to go through a systematic process of taking jobs, which comprise many different tasks, to take jobs, break them down into tasks, and figure out which are the tasks that are amenable to AI augmentation or automation. And I find that when we go through that brainstorming exercise, pretty much every time, we find tons of opportunities that, that you know, end up being exciting for businesses to pursue. Um, Personally, what I'd like to see, rather than where we're going, <laughs> is more, um, more work on human value alignment. Mm. And it's really easy to understand what that means. And we all have a general concept of, you know, we all have a certain set of values. But the reality is that when you come down to it, your values, my values, the values in the West, the values in the East. So it's not about human value alignment. It's, a, it's alignment with a certain set of values that you can be transparent about, that you can provide control over, and that you can hold yourself or the model accountable for. So it's not only to get the models themselves to be aligned with a certain set of values, but having a control, transparency, accountability, and flexibility so that we can all have versions of that model, applications of those models that align with the values that we want and we can feel safe about. And we don't have to agree on all those values. There is a core set of values that most of us, I guess, I hope, 
agree on, but there are certain things that will differ. And I think that it's extremely important that that happens sooner rather than later, so that the democratization of the usage of, of these technologies can go further and can go beyond what we think our values are into all kinds of communities, um, geographies, and, and domains. And the second thing that I'm also super excited about is the application of all this AI to the different science uh, fields of science. Because we have already seen examples of how AI can help change overnight you know, challenges that, that have been in, in different fields for decades or centuries. And all of a sudden, you know, something that took five years to do, and that takes you five minutes to do. And, and as we open all those tools in, and we let people just go crazy and do all kinds of experimentations with it, we're going to see an unprecedented number of disruptions and breakthroughs and new ways of seeing the world that is going to change who we are as a society. So um, I think that's where we're going. Yeah. I want to take a couple of questions. Does anyone in the crowd have a question? Just, um, yeah, please. Thank you so much for a great uh, panel. I'm Landry Signé, uh, senior of you at the Brookings Institution and executive director at the Thunderbird School of Global Management for GC. So there's a couple of dimensions that I would like you to elaborate on. So with uh, uh, Gen uh, AI, we have the pacing challenge, the incredible speed of development, and also the coordination challenge, the multiplicity of actor uh, and of usages which could also be made. So, and we are here discussing AI governance. How do you think that various stakeholders could work together to address that pacing uh, and coordination challenges, knowing that the public sector, um, the ability of the public sector to evolve with speed or with velocity is pretty much different from the one uh, of the private sector, let alone um, the uh, civil society and a diversity of stakeholders and what participation means, because we also speak about the imperative of including civil society, so civil society, but what level of participation will also be considered as meaningful. Thank you. I'll keep it short. It's tough, but I think education is going to be key. Um, uh, recently, is teaching Gen to VI for everyone on Coursera, but I think helping everyone have a basic understanding will be important to, to let all the stakeholders participate. But I think Peter looks like he's going to say something. Well, I mean, it's a you know, it's a core question, and yet it's almost a question that's impossible to answer, right? I mean, I, I think we we do what we can. We engage in in um, venues like this to discuss. I think anybody in the field, um, whether you're a deployer, a builder, just a user, should be engaged um, with government as government considers you know, regulation. I think you should get out and try it. Um, there's, there's all sorts of organizations which exist today to facilitate conversations. Um, you know, uh, speaking for AWS and Amazon, right? We fund lots of research for third parties. Like there's just like so many different levers that you need to pull to sort of engage people in these discussions. Um, and I don't know that there is any one lever. And I don't know, like there's so many different, you know, speeds at which different organizations, whether they're civil sector, private sector, government move, you know, so how to steer it all, I don't know. The best you can do is, is contribute and engage. Um. I'd like to add something as well. Um, the way I think about this is like when you go to the beach and there is a lifeguard or there is no lifeguard. And if there is no lifeguard because regulation has not made it that far, then you're swimming on that beach at your own risk. So education is important to understand the risks that you're undertaking as a developer, as a user, as an organization, etc. And regulation can at least be transparent in terms of is there a safeguard of some sort here or not? Are you swimming at your own risk in that particular area? Yeah. Well, you can also bring your family to the beach to watch out for you, I think. <laughs> your, That's how I would think of it. You? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one. Yes. Okay. 
Thanks a lot for a nice discussion. Daniel Dobosch, uh, Swisscom Research Director. And you mentioned nicely basically the comparison to electricity and looking at the history of electricity, people discussed a lot about all the risk that it will bring us and what people will use it for, what people will misuse it for. Same with connectivity, what people will do if they now um, have information at any given moment. So let me try to bring you a little bit in the future of, I don't know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and this is my question. Will we sit here, I don't know, in five, 10, 20 years and discuss that the biggest risk is that we made AI a critical, sorry, critical infrastructure, and the biggest risk is that we don't have it available anymore and our services cannot work without anymore? Oh, I see relatively little risk of uh, us deploying AI and then for some reason AI becoming unavailable unless some really horrible regulation shuts it down. I feel like, um, you know, AI has risks and I think a lot of things that, that you know, Sarah, Peter, Pilar described, they, they, um, one of the challenges AI, it is different than previous technologies and I think something that Sarah alluded to is that um, there's different boundary conditions than earlier technologies so we don't really know as well exactly when it's going to work and when it's not going to work, which is why the way we manage it and govern it, it is different. But I can tell you that I work with a lot of um, product teams that are doing you know, just fine in terms of testing it extensively, deploying responsibly, having human in the loop until we're confident it is safe. So I think that a lot of fears for, for, for AI um, is not that AI is harmless and will never do harm, but I think that a lot of fears are overblown. Um, Anyone else agree with that? A lot of the fears are overblown? I, I tend to agree in the sense that I always think the best way forward with risk is to uh, allocate resources to the risks that we see every day. I probably disagree with Andrew a little bit in the sense that I do think they're enormous risks that even happen with our models deployed right now and that we need to allocate. But I do agree in the sense that we need more scrutiny for domain sensitive areas. We, we need to allocate core fundamental research. You know, one of the most promising things I've seen recently is that every country wants to start an AI safety institute, <laughs> which I think is actually not a bad thing. I think it will funnel needed research and strengthen within government uh, technical talent, which has been notoriously difficult for governments to attract in the West. And I think it's really important that you have technical people informing how what are the realities of, of how, how these models succeed and are brittle? What I will say, and where we agree, is that for me, um, there's been a lot of anxiety around long-term existential risk, which for me feels like in some ways um, a way that sometimes displaces conversations about the reality of how these models are deployed. And I, I think that I always ask, well, how do we measure progress along this axis of existential? And we don't have a measure of progress because there are many possible risks and it's hard to quantify appropriately what is the actual probability or likelihood of it existing. Okay. Go for, uh, Andrew, do you want to say? No, so I actually spoke with quite a few people about the existential risk and candidly, I don't get it. Yeah, um, many agree. of them are very <laughs> late. <laughs> Go ahead, clap, please, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Many of them are vague and fluffy yeah. statements, and I can't disprove that AI could yes. wipe us out, no more than I can disprove that radio waves emitted from Earth won't attract <laughs> aliens to come and wipe us out. But it's so fluffy, I don't know what to do about that because I can't you know, disprove prove, prove, prove a, prove a negative. And I, and I agree with Sarah, it is a distraction from, you know, frankly, is there disinformation or misinformation on media or social media? Those are some short-term things where we could pass transparency and safety types of regulations and take actions that this other thing is a huge distraction from. Oh, by the way, when I speak of U.S. government officials, many of them kind of roll their eyes. They say, yeah, what, you know, kind of like, whereas interestingly, Europe is taking uh, extinction risk more seriously, so there is a divergence. And one of the things I see is I, there is a faction in U.S. government that tragically because of real or perceived adversaries potentially having access to open source, there is a faction in U.S. government that would welcome a slowing down with, of, of open source because of you know, potential adversaries, real or perceived, having access to it. In contrast, um, the European moves to slow down open source, it seems 
I, I don't understand really the, the uh, frankly, I think that if we were to slow down open source, Europe would be one of the places that is shut out because of the concentration in the US right now. So I feel like a lot of the, I think the theory of slowing down U open source in the US is flawed. I don't think it's a good idea. And then I think it's even more obviously not a good idea for Europe because Europe would be one of the places that is shut out uh, if, if, if some of these laws come to pass. I know I'm pushing it, but I am going to take one more question. Um, is anyone? Yeah, please. Thank you very much. Um, Andrew, you recently tweeted about your son creating a mess with uh, a chocolate uh, cookie that he found from the pantry. But in that tweet, you brought out um, what I think is one of the most important points, which is it just might be easier to align AI with human values than aligning humans with human values. And I think that is the biggest risk as far as you know, coming from a country like India. That's one of the biggest risks that we see um, because even even as we speak of AGI, et cetera. But you know, behind every smart algorithm, there is a smarter human being still. And, and how do you, any thoughts on how do you fix this problem? <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. So, so what, what happened, couple week, weekend, one or two weeks ago, my son got into the pantry, stole chocolate, made a mess. I was you know, kind of slightly annoyed as a parent. And, and I tweeted out, um, at that moment, I definitely felt like I had better tools to align AI with human values than I had tools to align my two-year-old son with human values. Um, and more seriously, I feel like uh, the tools for aligning AI with human values, they are better than most people think. They're not perfect, but if you use ChatGPT or BART and try to get it to give you detailed instructions for committing harm or committing a criminal act, it's actually really difficult to, to, to get AI to do that because it turns out that if we teach an AI um, we want it to be you know, honest, hopeful, and harmless. It really tries to do that. And we can set the numbers in the AI to kind of very directly have it do that. Whereas, you know, how do you convince someone not to invade Ukraine? I, I, I don't know how to, how to do that. So I actually sincerely find that uh, we have better tools, more powerful than the public broadly appreciates for just telling an AI to do what we want. Um, and then while it will fail to do so in some corner cases, it tends to get a lot of publicity. Um, AI is probably already safer than most people think, which is not to uh, which is not to say we should not also have maybe every country build their have a view on AI safety and keep on investing significantly in it. Thank you all.